Je vous prie de prendre place. Nous allons commencer. Monsieur le secrétaire perpétuel, monsieur le chancelier, chers consoeurs et confrères, honorable invité, nous allons inaugurer cette deuxième journée de la 16e session plénière solennelle annuelle de l'Académie Hassan II des sciences et techniques. En commençant par l'élection du directeur des séances, et je voudrais appeler le professeur Aziz Fiani pour prendre la relève. Aziz. Je vous souhaite un plein succès dans la conduite de nos travaux et je vous cède la place. Monsieur le secrétaire perpétuel de l'Académie, Hassan II des sciences et techniques, Monsieur le chancelier, Mesdames, Messieurs les membres de notre Académie, honorable assistance. Permettez-moi d'abord d'exprimer mes vifs remerciements à l'Académie et ses membres pour m'avoir élu et confier la responsabilité de la direction des séances pour l'année en cours. Je saisis cette occasion pour exprimer également mes vifs remerciements et mes chaleureux remerciements à mon prédécesseur, si Mohamed Aïtoukadé, pour sa disponibilité au cours de ces années de pandémie, pour la sérénité et les dévouements avec lesquels il a dirigé nos débats qui étaient souvent très animés. Alors, pour commencer la journée, comme ça a été annoncé hier par M. le secrétaire perpétuel, je donne la parole à notre chancelier pour présenter les nouveaux membres de notre Académie. Chers consoeurs, chers confrères, ravi de vous voir tous bien portants et ravi de nous réunir de nouveau au cours de cette session plénière, honorable invité. L'un des moments forts de notre Académie est l'accueil des nouveaux membres et j'ai le plaisir et l'honneur de vous présenter aujourd'hui deux nouveaux membres associés et un membre correspondant. Et je commence par professeur Maouton Norbert Onkounou, à qui je demande amicalement de se lever pour être vu reconnu par les membres de l'Académie. <applaudissements> Professeur Onkounou est né en 1954 au Bénin. Il est professeur titulaire de mathématiques et de physique à l'Université Abomey. 
qu'à la vie de contenu de la République du Bénin. Professeur Onkounou détient une thèse de doctorat en sciences obtenue en 1992 de l'Université catholique de Louvain en Belgique avec spécialité en mathématiques et physique mathématique. Son travail de recherche sur les mathématiques non commutatives et non linéaires incluant les équations différentielles, la théorie des opérateurs et les états cohérents ainsi que la théorie des graphes. Il a supervisé les travaux de recherche de plus d'une trentaine de doctorants et d'une quarantaine de thèses de master. Il est l'auteur de plus de 200 articles indexés et de plusieurs ouvrages spécialisés. Il est le fondateur de la chaire internationale de physique, mathématiques et applications, du SIMPA, le Centre international de mathématiques pures et appliquées. Il est actuellement le président du NASAC, le réseau africain des académies des sciences qui regroupe plus d'une trentaine d'académies des sciences nationales à l'échelle du continent. Il est membre de l'Académie africaine des sciences, du TWAS, the World Academy of Sciences, membre du comité scientifique de l'UNESCO pour le programme international des sciences fondamentales. Il a été également, il a été également président de l'Académie nationale des sciences et des arts et des lettres du Bénin et co-président de la conférence des réseaux des académies africaines, européennes et méditerranéennes pour l'enseignement des sciences. Il a reçu plusieurs distinctions et prix, notamment la médaille de chevalier de l'Ordre national du Bénin, le prix NR Rao pour la recherche scientifique, et il est aussi titulaire du prix du président de l'Université des sciences de Tokyo en 2015. Professeur Onkounou, je vous félicite pour la confiance royale et pour votre nomination en tant que membre associé à l'Académie Hassan II des sciences et techniques. Et je demande aux membres de notre compagnie de vous souhaiter la bienvenue par leur applaudissement. Je vous donne la parole, professeur Onkounou. Monsieur le directeur de sciences, monsieur le secrétaire perpétuel de l'Académie à Saint II des sciences et techniques, monsieur le chancelier, chers consoeurs et chers confrères, distingués invités, j'adresse en toute humilité toute ma gratitude et ma déférence à Sa Majesté le Roi, que Dieu le protège, pour avoir entériné la proposition de ma cooptation à l'Académie Hassan II des sciences et techniques du Maroc, soumise par le Conseil de l'Académie. Je remercie par la même occasion mes parrains, les éminents membres du Conseil, ainsi que toutes les consoeurs et tous les confrères de l'Académie, pour avoir porté leur choix sur ma modeste personne. Je promets continuer à renforcer les liens de collaboration qui existent entre l'Académie et les sociétés savantes auxquelles j'appartiens, mais aussi et surtout à œuvrer davantage par mon engagement et mes relations pour l'exécution de la mission de l'Académie la, et l'atteinte de ses objectifs dont je défendrai les valeurs partout dans le monde. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, professeur Ankounou, et encore félicitations. Permettez-moi de vous présenter le deuxième membre associé, professeur Daniel Nahon, à qui je demande aimablement de se lever.
Professeur Daniel Nahan est né en 1943 en France. Il détient un doctorat de troisième cycle de géologie appliquée au génie civil en 1968 et un doctorat d'état et sciences en 1976. Il est actuellement professeur émérite à l'université Paul Cézanne d'Aix-Marseille et professeur honoraire de l'Institut universitaire de France. Il est également président du directoire de recherche de l'université d'Aix-Marseille. Ses travaux de recherche portent sur la nature des sols et notamment les altérations qu'ils subissent dans les pays chauds, arides, semi-arides et tropicaux. Il a publié plus de 200 articles dans des journaux indexés et d'une dizaine d'ouvrages, parmi lesquels on cite « La marche de Gaïa, de la pierre à l'homme, sauvant l'agriculture, science de la terre, science de l'univers », l'épuisement de la terre, géosciences de l'environnement et autres, autres ouvrages. Il a fondé en 1995 le CEREG, le Centre européen de recherche et d'enseignement en géosciences de l'environnement. Il a présidé le CIRAD, le Centre de coopération internationale en recherche agronomique pour le développement. Il était directeur général de la recherche au ministère français de l'éducation nationale et de la recherche entre 1997 et 1998. Il était aussi conseiller spécial du ministre de l'éducation nationale, M. Claude Allègre. Il agit actuellement en tant que conseiller du PDG de l'Office chérifien des phosphates et de l'Université Mohamed VI Polytechnique Ben Grir pour les questions agricoles. Il est conseiller scientifique de, du Technopole de l'Arbois, membre de l'Académie des sciences du Brésil et professeur invité dans plusieurs universités à travers le monde, dont les quatre continents. Il a reçu plusieurs distinctions et prix le prix scientifique du Brésil en 2005 le prix Georges Millot de l'Académie des sciences de France en 2009, le prix de la Fondation Théritique en 2013 et la médaille de l'Université de Kyoto. Professeur Mahan, je vous félicite pour la confiance royale et pour vous, votre nomination en tant que membre associé à l'Académie Hassan II des sciences et techniques. Et... Pareillement, je demande aux membres de l'Académie de l'accueillir chaleureusement avec leur applaudissement. À vous, à vous la parole, professeur Nahon. Merci. C'est un grand honneur, monsieur le secrétaire général, monsieur le chancelier, monsieur le président, d'avoir été reçu dans cette Académie par mes éminents collègues. Et je voudrais tout particulièrement remercier Sa Majesté le Roi du Maroc pour sa bienveillance de m'avoir proposé à cette Académie. C'est un très grand honneur. Un double honneur, parce que je ne suis pas né à Paris, je suis né à Casablanca. Et donc pour moi, c'est en plus une Académie de cœur. J'ai quitté très tôt le Maroc, mais quand j'y suis revenu, j'ai senti, moi, spécialiste du sol, que je touchais là ma terre éternelle. Donc, devenir immortel parmi vous, c'est un privilège. C'est un grand privilège. J'ai eu une carrière scientifique et d'administration de la recherche pour promouvoir en particulier les sols et l'agriculture et la recherche et l'innovation. C'est la raison pour laquelle, en 2021, l'Union européenne et l'Union africaine m'ont désigné expert, parmi les six experts, expert pour la transition verte de l'Afrique en recherche et innovation. Et c'est avec autant de cœur et de fierté que j'essaierai d'œuvrer au mieux, avec toutes mes possibilités, toute mon âme et tout mon savoir, à l'agrandissement de la recherche, à l'approfondissement de l'innovation, 
au sein de cette Académie. Chers collègues, je vous remercie infiniment. Permettez-moi de vous présenter le nouveau membre correspondant, professeur Bouchtas Haraoui, à qui je demande aimablement de se lever. Professeur Bouchtas Haraoui est né en 1970 au Maroc. Il a obtenu son diplôme de master en physique de l'Université Nicolas Copernic à Turum en Pologne en 1992 et le diplôme de doctorat en physique en 1996 de l'Université d'Angers en France et également de l'Université Nicolas Copernic en 1998. Il obtient ensuite l'habilitation à diriger les recherches en 2001 de la même université. Ses travaux de recherche portent sur l'optique photonique et leur application dans les domaines des cellules photovoltaïques, notamment, et pour la caractérisation de propriétés de composés hautement conjugués, organiques et inorganiques. Il a à son actif plus de 380 publications indexées et 14 ouvrages scientifiques. Il est actuellement professeur des universités de classe exceptionnelle 2 à l'Université d'Angers en France. Il a aussi plusieurs responsabilités éditoriales de plusieurs journaux spécialisés. Il collabore depuis plusieurs années avec plusieurs universités marocaines, et notamment l'Université Chouaïb de Cali de Jadida et l'Université Hassan II de Casablanca. Il a eu le prix de recherche de son université en 2006 et le prix de distinction du ministère de l'Éducation nationale de Pologne. Professeur Sraoui, je vous félicite pour la confiance royale et pour votre nomination en tant que membre correspondant de notre compagnie. Et je demande aux membres de l'Académie de l'accueillir avec leur applaudissement. À vous la parole, professeur Sahraoui. Bonjour, bonjour. Et merci beaucoup, monsieur le chancelier de l'Académie Hassan II des sciences et techniques, pour cette présentation. Tout d'abord, je remercie grandement l'Académie de m'avoir sélectionné. Je suis vraiment très honoré d'être parmi vous. Je tiens à remercier Sa Majesté Mohamed VI pour la confiance royale qui, qui m'a accordé. Euh, euh, je suis vraiment prêt et engagé à servir l'Académie, contribuer à son rayonnement international et au développement scientifique de mon pays, le Maroc, qui, 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 me, qui me tient vraiment à cœur. Je, je, je ne ménagerai aucun effort pour euh, promouvoir l'excellence, faire bénéficier les jeunes marocains, euh, chercheurs confirmés, moins confirmés, pour bénéficier non seulement de mon laboratoire, mais aussi de réseaux que j'ai, euh, du large réseau européen que j'ai et international, que ce, que ce soit sur le plan scientifique ou sur euh, le, le rayonnement de mes, de, des activités du Maroc. Et je vous remercie. Merci, monsieur le secrétaire, monsieur le chancelier. Et encore une fois, félicitations pour les nouveaux membres de notre Académie et nous, le, nous souhaitons pour eux un, de plein, un plein succès dans toutes les actions et les travaux qu'ils vont entreprendre sous la tutelle de notre Académie. Nous passons donc au programme scientifique de, de cette journée et nous commençons par deux, conver, deux conférences d'invités de, distingués de notre Académie. Et avant de donner la parole au premier, <coughs> au premier orateur, j'aimerais dire que parmi les tâches qui m'ont été confiées, c'est de veiller au respect du timing durant cette journée. Et j'exhorte euh, tous les orateurs et les intervenants de me faciliter la tâche pour qu'on rende, qu rende le micro à temps. Alors... It's a great pleasure to me to call 
Dr. Cheng Fan to talk about role of science and technology in transforming food system. The doctor, Professor Cheng Fan, is doyen de l'Académie d'économie et de la politique alimentaire globale. Il est titulaire de la, de la chaire d'université d'agriculture de Chine et directeur de l'International Food Policy Research Institute. The, the floor is yours. Ah, okay, now it's working now. All right, great. But once again, uh, well, the perpetuated secretary, uh, secretary, chancellor of the um, Hassan II Academy of Science and Technology, and my great friend, Dr. Muhammad Aikari, and my new friend, Dr. Fazi, uh, he is also the um, program director of the ICARA, uh, based in Syria, where right now in Lebanon. So good to see lots of friends over here, and um, my, my colleague, uh, Papa Sack from CGIA, uh, CGIA time. So it is my great honor to speak to you on the role of science and technology in transforming food systems. So I have been working on food and agriculture for the last 40 years, maybe even more, starting from a small farm in China 45 years ago, then begin to move to study agriculture, food science, rural development in China, as well as in the US. Then I worked for International Food Policy Research Institute for 25 years, where Dr. Mohamed Aik Khadid was like my boss. He was the chair. <laughs> he was the committee member of the IPRI board. So I think together uh, we have made an effort to transform the global and the national agricultural systems and food system in many countries. So I came back to China exactly three years ago, just before the COVID. So I set up this academy called Academy of Global Food Economics and a Policy. Continue to do the work uh, in the food system transformation. I truly believe that the science of technology, the innovations will be so critical in transforming our food system for better nutrition, better health, better environment, and to mitigate the climate change. Let me see whether I can move this, huh? Okay. Ah, there we go. So I will speak on three issues. Number one is food systems are facing numerous challenges, unprecedented challenges. The second is that science and technology innovation have already been transforming our food systems. So I will give you some examples. And obviously more needs to be done. So what are the pathways for further enhancing innovations in food system transformation? We know that the number one challenge is hunger. Today we still see rising hunger globally. So even standing here today, we have 800 people, sorry, 800 million people who suffer from hunger. And look at the chart on the right-hand side. Since 2015, the number, hung, number of hunger has been on the rise for many reasons. The climate change probably is the top reason, but the regional conflicts, conflicts even here in the neighboring country, the Middle East, and, uh, and recently in Ukraine and Russia, and obviously COVID-19, the pandemic, have really increased the number of hungry people by a big margin. And this is very far away from the target of zero hunger by 2030. So business as usual, so if we continue our trend, I'm afraid by 2030, we will still have probably 600 million hungry people, maybe even 800 million people who will suffer from hunger if we don't do anything. And if you look at a region, to your surprise, majority of hungry people actually is in Asia in Asia. 
India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Myanmar, Southeast Asia, and so on. But China, obviously, right now, I mean, for the last three years, I've been traveling in China. I'm very proud that probably the hunger has been eliminated, partly because poverty has been eliminated by 2030. Oh, sorry, by 2020. By 2020, China declared that poverty is gone. And by that definition, hunger is gone. But now I wanted to mention another hunger called a hidden hunger, the lack of micronutrients, iron, zinc, vitamin A, and many other micronutrients that our body need. And that hunger is still persistent. Even in my own country, China, probably 300 million people still suffer from lack of vitamin A, lack of iron, means anemia, anemic, and also zinc. So the hidden hunger affects our body, our health, as serious as visible hunger. So let's not forget about that. So some pe people may have enough to eat, maybe even overweight or obese, but lack of micronutrients can really affect that person's productivity, mental health, and, well, obviously, the general health. And here, I think in the world, probably 2 billion, maybe even 3 billion people suffer from hidden hunger, the lack of micronutrients. Now, the burden of diseases and the pests, I know you are scientists here, you know, look at how much product, crop production has been lost because of pests and disease, like wheat, you know, 20%, 30% in rice, 20% in maize, 70% in potato, 21% in soybean. So you can see we lost quite a bit food from from disease and pests. And animal diseases obviously clearly affect our animal production. But equally important, animal diseases can jump into humans. COVID-19, avian influenza, and even HIV AIDS. So all these zoonotic diseases have been affecting human and animals. Now the growing climate related vulnerability, you know, we know that we have suffered from climate change already. So you can look at some of the figures. For every one degree increase in our temperature, so we will lose 6% of wheat, 7% of maize, 3% of rice, and 3% of soybean. You may think rice loves hot weather. No, it's not true. You know? So high temperature actually affects the rice flowering. You know, you know, I'm a small rice farmer in, back in China 45 years ago. Hot weather actually affects the rice production as well, in addition to its impact on wheat, maize, soybean, and so on. Now, the food system is also a contributor. We heard that it's a victim of the climate change. It is also a contributor. So um, I have been part of the UNEP effort. You know, I, I chaired a, a chapter on food system transformation of a global, gas, uh, global emission gap report you will see that our food system account for more than 30% of greenhouse gas emission. So of the total, one third of the problem, one third of emissions came from food systems. And obviously agriculture production right now still comes for 40% of the total agriculture emission. And then land use, land change, deforestation, more than 30%, and the supply chain activity. We, we use quite a bit of energy we also waste quite a bit of food in our supply chain. So that accounts for 29%. And for development countries, the greenhouse gas emission usually comes from pre and post production. But for developing countries, it's in the middle of the production. And the soil under pressure, the soil nutrient loss, you will see that you know, many, let's say, minerals deficiency are very severe. So I know Morocco has a very big company, OP, OPC, the biggest fertilizer, one of the biggest fertilizer company in the world. So that company plays a huge role in supplying key nutrients to our soil. So barom, uh, meridanium, zinc, and so on, all the deficiencies. So it's not just the nit nitrogen. It's not just a, let's say, pot potash or uh, phosphorus. They are serious, but I think equally important, maybe more important, is some of the key minerals that are deficient in many parts of the world. 
and then soil salinization. I know ICADA has been working on this, Equisat, all the CGI centers have been working on it. Chinese scientists are also working on that. But you will see that in a big, big part of our soil suffers from salinization, particularly in some of the tropical areas. And in Morocco is no exception. And here I wanted to speak a bit about the water scarcity. We learned quite a bit from Dr. Mohamed Aikari. Every time when we have our board meeting in Washington or in other places, he told us that water scarcity is a huge problem. And he, indeed, he was a pioneer. He was a leader in water work, the Global Water Partnership, in the International Water Resource Institutes. Um, so all these are working on water issues. You will see that the, in many parts of the developing countries, water scarcity has become even worse. I don't have a chart here. IPRI produced another figure to show the changes of water scarcity over time. The next 30, 40 years, it is in Africa, it is in South Asia, Southeast Asia, water scarcity will become the most severe, serious problem. So loss of biodiversity. So we just finished the COP uh, on biodiversity in Montreal. Before that, it was in China. And uh, you know, agriculture, food system, account for probably 60% of the loss of biodiversity in the world. Again, we are part of the problem. When you lose biodiversity, you lose good, that's a nutrition from crops. You also lose good genetics from crops. And that prevents the future challenges to our food system. So science technology. I think some, to some extent, science and technology have already been transforming our food systems. So I just want to give you some uh, example. So science and technology is so critical, is essential, because our resources have become very limited. Population continue to increase, particularly in Africa. The only way is to use science and technology. So science and technology can increase productivity, increase the nutrition of certain crops. I will elaborate that a little bit. And to increase the resilience, you know, climate change is affecting us. And obviously, science and technology can also help to mitigate the climate change from food systems. And finally, together with institutional change, science and technology can present new opportunities um, to transform our food systems. So increase productivity. So you will see that it's not just rice and wheat and maize, it's soybean. To our surprise, soybean productivity increase has a greater potential in Africa. For the last probably 10 to 20 years, the global soybean demand has been rising very quickly, largely because of emerging economies, China in, uh, included. China is importing more than 100 million tons of soybean. Where do they import? From, from uh, US, from uh, Brazil, but Africa has great potential. So look at some of the experiments in West Africa. So soybean yield can increase by 50%, maybe even 70% using some you know, newer varieties and good practices. And so now I wanted to mention the Narika, my, my friend, uh, my brother, Papa Sack is here, under his leadership, Narika rice has been adopted widening in Africa. So that has increased. Not, so not only the area increased, but also the yield. So the Narika rice can produce six to seven tons per hectare, compared to the traditional variety, only one or two tons. And obviously, the scientists from the West Africa, from Africa rice, continue to innovate rice not just the varieties, but also good practice irrigation technologies and pests and the disease control. Now, improve nutrition. So we, we always thought that science and te technology can increase the crop yield, but the role of enhancing nutrition is equally important, sometimes maybe even more important, because right now, I think probably calorie, the energy in our diet is already adequate. It's a nutrition. So through breeding, through science technology, 
the intake or the content of nutrition, vitamin A, zinc, iron, can be enhanced. When I was working at IPRI, we have a very large program called biofortification to increase vitamin A, zinc, and iron of certain major food crops, maize, soybean, uh, maize, beans, then the millet, rice, wheat, and so on. And I'm very proud that today, in Africa, probably more than 60 million smallholders and their families are already consuming biofortified foods. Not even GM, it's, it's through traditional breeding. So huge, let's say, impact on our nutrition. So for example, many girls in India are anemic. 60% of rural girls in India is anemic. When they are anemic, their immunity system will be affected. They are very vulnerable to certain diseases. And equally importantly, the children they give, the, the girls give, usually are also not very healthy. But through biofortification, we can add iron into millet. It's a major stable crop in the southern part of India. And through our experiments, the anemia can be reduced from 60% to 30%, even, even, even lower. So then build a resilience. We know, we know that you know, climate is changing. Our crop production has been reduced. How can we and build a resilience of our crops against droughts, floods, or even diseases? I'm happy to report that some of the CGI centers like Summit, or even ICADA and Equisat have already begun to introduce certain varieties, drought-tolerant maize, wheat, in many parts of the world, suck emergency tolerant rice. You know, rice like water, but if too much water, then rice will not be able to produce anything. But the scientists from Erie have already introduced certain rice that can be submerged under water. So they can still produce a very good crop and, and a sort of tolerant. Here, that I have to say, the Chinese scientists are in the frontier. And on the coast of China, there are lots of it's a soil that has very high salt content. And the Chinese scientists have introduced certain rice, actually through GMO, that can tolerate very high level salt. And they can produce a very good crop. And what's the second agriculture? So we know that we have used too much inputs outside of the farm. This is not sustainable. How can we really let's just recycle nutrients or products within the agriculture food system? And another sign and technology that have played a role. And here, regenerative agriculture, regenerate to so agriculture food can, can be regenerated through itself, particularly livestock and crop mix system. So you recycle as animal manures as organic fertilizer for, for crops. You can use very little external inputs to still produce a good crop. And that food is usually are organic, have a higher premium. And some of the smallholders in China, India, have already experimented the regenerative agriculture. And here you can see that the regenerative agriculture can increase yield, can reduce carbon emissions, enhanced nutrition, and equally important, the resilience. Because you don't need to use a global trade system like soybean. Soybean is produced in Brazil, transported to somewhere coastal city in China, and then the soybean is being processed into soy meals as animal feed. The animal feed will be transported somewhere to Shanghai, Guangdong, Beijing to raise animals. When animals are raised, they're slaughtered and redistributed again to every citizen in the country. And that sort of system, to some extent, economic, it is efficient, but it's not sustainable. So nutrients come from Brazil and stay in China. Could you imagine after 50 years, what would happen? Global imbalance of nutrition. And also very vulnerable to shocks, climate shocks, conflicts, Anything happens, that supply chain can be stopped. And then 
let's say, if 30% or even 40% of soybean imports in China stop, that's a big impact. 400 million tons of soybean will not be able to be exported to China. So regenerative agriculture can help to solve part of the problem. The, now, you are, you are all scientists. I know some of the scientists here are working on certain biotechnology. GM, gene editing, synthetic bio, biology, all this you know, can really help to move the needles much further. So truly a game changer. E-commerce, so biotechnology and digital technology. Under the COVID, many smallholders were still able to sell their products, many through e-commerce. So I, I lived in China for more than two and a half years under COVID, strictly under control. Where do I get food? It's through all these trucks, point to point. The drivers will, will get food from communities, production communities, and shifted it to my university community. No contact at all. What works there? The e-commerce, because you can order your food through internet. You don't need to contact anybody. So e-commerce really help. I think in the future, the e-commerce will be even more critical to link smallholders to consumer urban centers through the internet. High values, organic, or any products you would, you would like to see. So what are the pathways? Can we do better? One is, today, I think the agriculture R&D investment is still not adequate. At April, we have a global database to connect every country's agriculture research investment. I'm very sad, I'm very sorry to report to you that for low-income countries, they spend very little on agriculture research. Only 0.3.4% of their agriculture GDP. For middle-income countries, except Brazil, China, and India, they spend even less, 0.2.4. I think, I don't know, I don't have the figure from Morocco. I heard yesterday from the Director General who represents the minister saying that the investment in R&D in Morocco has increased. I'm very happy to see that. But for many developing countries, they spend definitely less than 0.5% of their agriculture research as a percent of agriculture GDP. For rich countries, there's a France, US, they spend more than 2%, even 3%. So agriculture research intensity for any country should be more than 1%. So we're very far away from that. Now, in addition to the amount we spend on agriculture research, we should also reprioritize or reposition it. It's not just the yield. Yield is important, but equally important is other goals of the food system transformation. Nutrition, resilience, sustainability, inclusiveness. Make sure that smallholders, poor consumers, can also benefit from our food system transformation. And the research has to be reprioritized to achieve all this goal at the same time. So here, um, I think the CGIR is already working on that. I think Dr. Fazi know that. The whole CGIR is using food system as a concept to promote global agriculture research or food research to make sure that you know, the global research will help the country to achieve better nutrition, better health, it's a better environment, help to mitigate the climate change, and a smallholder will benefit, in addition to yield enhancing. Yes, technology is important. I think equally important is institution and policy. Without institutional change, without policy change, good technology will not be able to be used. For example, intellectual property rights. You, know, you are all scientists. If your rights are not protected, you have no incentive to innovate. Private sector, the same thing. And equally important is some of the new tech, GMO, gene editing, synthetic, synthetic bio, biotechnology, and also alternative proteins, artificial meat. I know it's happening very quickly in many countries, but if you don't have the proper evaluation, do not have a proper regulation system, you will not be able to move your top science research result to actual implementation. The people will not be able to benefit. And 
Here, I also wanted to emphasize the bundling. So it's not just technology, the institution policy all together. You remember the Green Revolution in India. It's not just the semi-dwarf wheat variety innovated by Norman, Norman Bollock. It is also the policy by Indian government, investment in irrigation, investment in marketing, investing in infrastructure, all this together. The Green Revolution happened. So it's a bundle in innovations. Now, finally, I want to emphasize global collaboration. I know the world has increasingly been divided, particularly after 2015. 2015 was a peak of globalization. Right after that, because of the anti-migration, anti-trade, anti-globalization in US, in Europe. You know, so we have a divided world. But I think food, agriculture should not have border. We should work together to promote South-South cooperation, R&D investment, technology transfer. Like, for example, here in China, Chinese food security depends on world food security. But on the other hand, Chinese food security can also contribute to, the, to the global food security. So we have this common vision, common view, common objectives. So South-South cooperation will be so critical. So uh, after four or five years of the COVID isolation, uh, we begin to go out, look for there's opportunities to work together. And here, I think Morocco definitely is one of our countries that we really wanted to enhance our collaboration in science and technology, policy, and so on, to continue the great collaboration and friendship with Dr. Uh, Muhammad Ali Khadi, maybe, you know, to go beyond, to include the academy, the universities, and the OPC. Because the government also asked me to check with OPC, you know, how can we really solve the global food in other crisis? So that's why international collaboration is so critical. With that, I want to thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof <coughs> Professor Schengen. Euh, le professeur Schengen nous a fait une présentation que je peux diviser en deux parties. La première concernant tout les facteurs, tous les facteurs influençant la productivité et qui jouent pour le moment en notre défaveur pour les pays en particulier en Afrique. Et la deuxième partie, il a insisté sur la place de la science et des technologies dans l'amélioration de cette productivité avec éventuellement quelques idées. Et je crois qu'on aura le temps, durant toutes ces, ces journées, de revenir sur ces chiffres et ces applications des sciences et technologies. Notre deuxième invité distingué dans cette demi-journée est le, le professeur Max, Maximo Torero, économiste en chef à la FAO, et qui va nous parler de la sécurité et souveraineté alimentaire Définition et enjeu. Professeur Maxime, Maximo Torero. Ah. Okay. Good morning. It's a pleasure for me to be with you today. Let me start by sharing my PowerPoint because the discussion I want to bring to the seminar today is about food security and sovereignty and the definitions and stakes. To understand how important this is in the current situation where we have an agri-food system that we need to transform, we need to produce more with less, we need to be sustainable in our nature and environment, but at the same time provide and give access to food to all, that is, to all the people that need it in a world which is very complex. Let, let me start by looking at the current situation and where we are and what is the stage of the global food security. First, it's important to understand is that if we look at the drivers of food insecurity and we rank them, the first will be conflicts and war, the war in Ukraine, 
The second will be slowdowns and downturns where COVID-19 has played a crucial role because COVID-19 has slowed down economies, has affected enormously the growth of economies and has increased indebtedness. That has, of course, affected the capacity of countries to have access to food. And third, we have climate variability and climate change, which affect in four dimensions, extreme temperatures, excessive water or lack of water, like what happened in Pakistan with the flooding, variability of, of the climate and therefore more uncertainty for farmers, and fifth, the evolution of open diseases that will change because of climate. Now, when we look at the analysis and analyze what explains food insecurity, these drivers don't, have, don't act individually, they also interact. And the most vulnerable countries, the most affected countries, have the multiplicity of these drivers. And this is in a world where poverty and extreme poverty is increasing. And as a result of that, the cost of access to healthy diets is increasing. So what is the major photo in terms of numbers? Poverty reduction, which was supposed to resume in 2021, is slowing down again and is increasing. That's because of the excess, excess increase in prices and the food inflation that was partially a result of the war in Ukraine. And this was under an environment where extreme poverty has substantially increased because of COVID-19. If we look at chronic undernourishment, consistent with the poverty numbers, chronic undernourishment has substantially increased in 150 million more before COVID-19. People chronically undernourishment, according to the SOFI for 2021. Now, if we just add to that 828 million people chronically undernourishment, the effect of COVID-19 and the effect of the war in Ukraine, we are talking of 10.7 million more people chronically undernourished because of the war in Ukraine. That puts us in 839 million people chronically undernourished. The new number will appear in July of this year that will incorporate all the increase in 2022. If we look at the short-term effect on food insecurity, we have 222 million people which are acute food insecure for 53 countries and territories covered by the, by the global food crisis report. This number could increase by the next report in, in, in April to around 20 million more. So the situation is daunting. It's a pretty bad situation that we are facing today, and that's why we have the huge challenge. Looking at the world food prices, we will see in the Food Price Index that the prices reach its highest historically in March 2022. And these prices are now falling, but still they are higher than the initial levels. Even if we look at real prices, we also see an increase. Of course, it's not the highest increase in terms of real terms historically, but it has been a significant shock. Not only is the food prices, but also if we look at our index of input prices, the input prices has increased substantially and they are still at high levels. Just looking at the price of Uria, for example, which has gone up to four times in 2022, today, despite of the, of the reduction, we are still between 2 to 2.5 higher than before the war in Ukraine. So the cost is not only increased for consumers, has also increased to producers. And the mirror of this is the increase in the food import bill in the case of the increase in food prices. The food import bill has increased substantially and today it reaches $2 trillion in the world. Just looking at the 62 most vulnerable countries, it has mean an increase in $25 billion more that they have to pay to access the same level and quality of food. This is a huge challenge in a world where today there is such level of debt distress. In 2023, we expect this to increase even more, not only because of prices. When in food prices, it's important to understand that right now, wheat is doing okay, ceteris paribus. There is some stress in coarse grain, but rice prices are increasing because of the effect of increasing input prices, which have affected the area planted of rice, and that has increased the reduced the supply and therefore increased the price. Second, there is the element of exchange rate devaluation, which will continue to deteriorate the local currencies and therefore increase the cost of buying a dollar, which means that my import bill will continue to increase. And again, countries, we have a count of around 20 to 22 countries in significant debt stress, which won't be able to have to access to financial resources and will have to pay very high interest rates to access to resources. All these will continue to increase in 2023, the full import bill. Similarly, the input import bill has increased in almost 50% in 2022 relative to 2021. So what this means, and this is mostly because of the increase in, in fertilizer prices and energy prices. Seeds still are not reflecting these increases because you need fertilizers to produce seeds, but it will soon do it. As a conclusion, we have an increase in the cost and affordability for consumers by the increase in the import, food import bill, but we also have an increase in the inputs for farmers which could create problems in terms of food availability. But if I have to summarize what we expect in 2023, 
is we expect a situation where we have food availability with a, a stress, we call it an orange light for rice, and some stress in coarse grains, especially in corn. But clearly, we will in have an increase of the problem of food access. Our expectation is that 2023 will deepen even more the food access because of this increase in, in exchange rate, deterioration of the local currencies, some increase in food prices, and also because of the debt stress. Now, what is the consequence of the effects in increasing the input in the input imports, in the in the cost of inputs, in the cost of fertilizers? Is that of course you will have less use of fertilizers and lower yields. This will mostly be affecting Sub-Saharan Africa, given that most of the other regions of the world were able to have access to fertilizer, although at higher prices. But the major effects, as shown in this map, is expected to be in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is yields for maize as an example. Now, clearly. Sub-Saharan Africa only imports 3% of its fertilizers in the world, and most of it is used for cash crops. Despite this, any change in a small number will have an impact. And that's why we will be observing these impacts in yields. And this is the most food insecure region in the world. Now, in this context, what are the definitions of food security and food sovereignty? And why we have to discuss between them? What are the differences? Food security means that all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food. It has five dimensions, availability of food on farms and in markets, access to that food so that food is available uh, by all households, effective utilization of the food within the household, sustainability of the food system, and stability of the food system. So three dimensions are at the level of the household, which is at the center, and two dimensions are at the level of the system, of the agri-food system. To increase availability, we need to use technologies, we need to respond, we need to innovate. That will allow to have more supply and will help to increase access. Of course, the market restructuring matters, and that's why we need to look and diversify our portfolio of production. But for effective utilization, we need to use in the most efficient way what we have and increase access to healthy diets. But we need to be sustainable and we need to produce more with less natural resources. That will assure that we will have also stability in the market. On the other side, we have the definition of food sovereignty. Food sovereignty is right of people to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecological, sound, and sustainable methods, and the right to define their own food and agricultural systems. It puts the aspirations and needs of those who produce, distribute, and consume food at the heart of the food systems and policies right under the demands of the market and corporations. Food access and availability is at the heart of the food security definition. The major difference is here is what is local, what is not local. What is a local and appropriate healthy and cultural appropriate system in difference to a food security, which is looking at access to healthy diets. So many definitions here that we need to look at carefully. But if we look at the six pillars of food sovereignty, that brings more clarity. First, it focuses on food for the people by placing people's needs for food at the center of the policies and insisting that food is more than just a commodity. And I think that's consistent with food security definition. Values food providers, supporting sustainable livelihoods and respecting the work of all providers. Localizes food systems, reducing the distance between suppliers and consumers, rejecting dumping and inappropriate food aid, and resisting to dependence of remote and accountable corporations. I think this point is one of the major differences because it's kind of restrictive to local production and not to global access to food. Fourth, places control at local level by placing control in the hands of local food suppliers, recognizing the need to inhabit and share territories, rejecting privatization of natural resources. Fourth, promotes knowledge and skills, building traditional knowledge, using research to support, pass on this knowledge to future generations and rejecting technologies that undermine local food systems. And six, works with nature by maximizing the contributions of ecosystems, improving resilience, rejecting an area intensive monocultural industrialization, and destructive production methods. Here, we also have a big difference with the definition of food system, of food security, because it's very difficult to assure that you will have at the local level the production that you need, and at the same time, assure sustainability. Let's just assume that you are in a water stress country. There are commodities that you cannot produce and you should not be producing because they won't assure sustainability. So we need to be very careful of the complexity of this definition and where are the trade-offs that we need to take into account. 
Now, why we think we need to focus on the food security definition rather than the food sovereignty definition? First is because today, as we have seen in the last three years, we are facing significant risk and uncertainties in the agri-food system. The agri-food system is a system that operates under risk and uncertainty. Not only in the food and agricultural production through the inputs, the trade issues, the logistical issues, the disease issues that are reflected in prices and production, but also on the, on the macro side, which there is a linkage with the energy sector, not only for biofuels, but also for fertilizer production. So we cannot isolate the food production from the input supplies. There is also the macroeconomic effect that has affecting exchange rates and is affecting the debt distress of countries. And on the humanitarian side, there are shocks that we cannot control. Nobody expected the war in Ukraine. So how we can assure that Ukraine, for example, will be food sovereignty in a situation that it has a war? That won't work. And there are many world countries in the world that are facing significant shocks and conflicts. As I said before, the key driver of food insecurity. So food needs to come from other places. And that is to avoid, of course, migration and, and mobility of refugees. And this is in a world where we are facing population growth, urbanization, and climate change, and water stress, which brings this uncertainty. So colleagues, we need to diversify our production in the world. It's the only way we will be resilient to these vulnerabilities. It's the only way we will be able to, to cope with these risks and uncertainties. We cannot restrict our capacities to one location, geographical location. We need to have access of our natural resources in the most efficient way. That's the only way we will be able to produce more with less. That's the only way we will be resilient. So we need to increase resilience. And resilience has three dimensions. Early warning, which means that we need to be prepared for the choke. Capacity of absorption, so how much I can absorb a choke. And here is where the definitions matter a lot. And the third dimension is how we can build back better. You don't want to make the big mistakes that we're making. For example, we observe today that Turkey, in, because of the earthquake, has bigger capacity of absorption than Syria, for motives that all of you know. But we also observe that we have to reconstruct back better in the case of Turkey, just to give an example. Now, we have developed in the SOFA 2021 a series of indicators of resilience. Primary production, we call it the Primary Production Flexibility Index. Food supply, dietary sourcing flexibility index transport networks, which are important, and economic access to healthy diets. All of these are different indicators that you can look at the SOFI 20, the SOFA 2021, but I will just focus on one. And the one I'm going to focus is the absorptive capacity. And the absorptive capacity of countries, food supply, depends on the diversity of domestic production and stocks and the diversity of imports and trade partners. We have to see, understand that the world is a world that one area, one country cannot produce everything they need. Of course, there will be exceptions, but that's not the average. So we need countries to be in a situation like the country B, where you have diversity of domestic production, and if possible, if they can reach self-sufficiency, that's okay, if they are using the resources in the most efficient way. What is not okay is to produce at a higher cost to our natural resources in a location when I can get a commodity from a location that have more of that natural resource. But we also need to diversify our imports and trade partners. What we observe in the Ukraine war was that most of the Northern African countries were not diversified at all. And that's where diversification was important, to have the partners ready. That does not mean that you don't procure from Ukraine because it was cheaper. It means that if Ukraine becomes expensive or the food cannot be supplied from Ukraine, you have other options immediately. So those two dimensions, plus the capacity of having stocks are central. And we have measured this. We have measured this for the world. And countries diversify food sources in different ways. Effectiveness of the diversification does not depend much on country size or income. And here you see that all the high income countries are very diversified in both dimensions and also in the stock level. But you see that the low middle income countries and even upper middle income countries show significant variance. And that's something to learn from. So this indicator gives an idea of how we can improve this dimension of resilience, which is the capacity to absorb the shock. Now, when we talk about food availability, we're also talking about food production and food security. We're talking about agricultural productivity, and we have seen over the time the evolution, the Green Revolution, and other innovations that has happened. But we need to look also at land use, land rights, and sustainable practices and risk. And sustainable practices are essential because it helps us to be less vulnerable to shocks if we do it properly. But it also encourages farmers to understand more sustainable practices so we not only look at the short term, but also the medium and long term. And we need to be inclusive and target women and indigenous people. So 
so that we have an inclusive process of agri-food system transformation. Now, why is it so important to understand what we are facing and the challenges we are facing and why this food security definition is more relevant in my understanding? First, the world is a world that is highly concentrated on the production of cereals. Few countries produce a significant share. Here we show in the past 207 to 08 how few countries produce more than 80% or 63% in the case of wheat and more than 90% in the case of rice, of all what is exported. Today, similar thing happened where just Russia and Ukraine produce 30% of the world's cereals. This evolution has changed over time. We see that combined the change between 1990 and 2019 of US and, and EU has been a basically stable, but we have seen a significant increase in Russia and Ukraine, an increase in 66 million metric tons of wheat, and a significant decrease in the case of Africa and Croatia. So this change in the structure of the market has made us more vulnerable. And that's what we need to diversify. We need to have the most efficient countries producing the cereal commodities, but we need to meet, have many big producers at the most productive way an efficient way in the world. Three, four is not enough. We need five, seven, eight. That assures that we have this distribution over the space and therefore we are less vulnerable to risk and shocks. Trade has shown to be significant. Look at in this graph, in the vertical axis, you have calories traded, horizontal times weeks since the shock. During the Ukraine war, trade barriers has had a significant impact, higher than even the food price crisis of 2007, 2008. And of course, higher than COVID-19. If we don't have trade, we will have increasing prices. And that's clearly shown here in the red line, the FAO food price index, and in the green line, the share of calories traded, the graph before. There is an association. That means that trade is central today. And that doesn't mean that I have to go to the extreme. It means that I need to allow for trade to happen. I need to allow for mobility of goods. And if we look at the distribution of the connectivity across products and countries in the world, it has improved substantially over time. But still, there is a lot of space to increase this connectivity that will allow goods to flow around the world. And why is this so important? Because if we look at the nine food groups that we need to be able to have access to healthy diets, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, the darker, the less you have of those nine food groups, lacks of those today. It could be in 10 years, 20 years, they can have uh, more food available. Even as they said today, Ethiopia has capacity to even export wheat potentially in the next years. But that doesn't mean that Ethiopia will have all the commodities and all the food groups that they need. This is why clearly trade is needed and we cannot think on localized production systems. We need to think on both increasing our productivity, being efficient in the way we use our natural resources, but also find ways in which we can increase access to diets and to healthy diets around the world. The same applies to fertilizers, highly concentrated. That's why Ukraine and uh, Russian Federation, sorry, which is the first exporter of nitrogen, the second of phosphorus and potassium, play a crucial role. This is not only across countries, highly concentration, but also within countries, very few plants. Look at the case of, of, of the case of, of potash, how concentrated it is and how important, for example, Belarus is today, which is on sanctions. So again, it's really important to understand that the market structure is not only at the end of the food value chain, it's also at the input side. And that's why trade will be always central because for fertilizer, you need natural resources. If you don't have trade, you won't be able to have access to them. And we cannot live in a world where we believe everything can be organic. We have seen the effects that has happened in Sri Lanka, for example. Now, the interrelationships with the energy market, which goes farther than just biofuels, has shown how these interrelationships and the potential trade-offs are so important today. Now, in the long term and the medium term, we're also facing with a huge challenge, which is climate change. And climate change will increase the frequency of events, and this will have an effect on the chronic undernourishment, as you can see in this graph. Drought sensitive countries has grown more than, drought, than other countries. And we need, to be, we need to find ways to cope with that. And again, the diversification of our production portfolio helps for doing that. Climate change will affect in different ways, and the trends are exacerbating. Today, for example, we are very close to the risk of El Nino and La Nina again. So a lot of sensitivity in the world today to climate. And that's why we need to be able to be ready and prepared. And water stress is another critical point that we don't talk too much about. But today, 128 million hectares, 11% of rainfall cropland, experience high to very high severe drought frequency. 
656 million hectares, 14% of pasture land, experience high to very high severe drought frequency. I'm here in, in Kenya today, where they have had three, four sequential years of drought that is affecting enormously their production and, and the pasture land. We have 171 million hectares, 62% of irrigated cropland experiences high to very high water stress. So colleagues, it's important to understand that we are in a high risk world, a world of uncertainty in the agri-food system. And we need to transform and we need to make it more resilient and to ensure healthy diets are affordable for all. And for that, the mobility of goods will be central. Global value chains will be central. Also local production will be important. But we cannot go to extremes. We need to diversify as much as possible our portfolio. And we need to bring a portfolio approach that integrates communitarian development with peacemaking policies in conflict affected areas, scaling up climate resilience across agri-food systems, strengthening resilience of the most vulnerable economic adverse situations, in intervening along the food supply chain to lower the cost of nutritious foods, tackling poverty and structural inequalities, ensuring interventions are free and poor and inclusive, and strengthening the food environments and changing consumer behavior to produce dietary partners with positive impacts on human health and to promote those so that consumers also change the way they eat. We need a transformation that changes the incentives we have in place. We need a transformation that changes how we allocate support to agriculture. We need a transformation that optimizes the use of our natural resources. A transformation that helps us to reduce emissions to the world so that we have a sustainable production system over time. This change is really needed and a lot of work needs to be done, but we cannot go into a debate of the extreme situations. I think it's essential that we foresee the definition that we have in place of food security and trying to achieve it in, in creating this transformation of the agri-food system. Thank you so much for your support. And again, sorry that I couldn't be with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Maximo Torero for this excellent lecture. Now, si vous permettez, après ces deux brillantes conférences qui ont souligné l'intérêt, d'abord les difficultés de, de la souveraineté et la sécurité alimentaire aujourd'hui, nous avons entendu des chiffres et des propositions sur lesquelles on va probablement revenir au cours de la journée. Sur ce, je pense qu'on va passer à la pause, étant donné que les questions seront au cours de la journée, vont revenir plusieurs fois. C'est des problématiques qui sont très importantes et sur lesquelles on va revenir au cours des différentes présentations. Il me reste donc à remercier mes, les deux conférenciers pour la présentation et la confé les, conf les deux conférences qu'ils nous ont données. Et il est temps d'une pause de 15 minutes en respectant les temps pour qu'on puisse un peu gagner sur le retard qu'on a eu au, au début de cette journée. Merci. <rire>